Good evening to all that are here in our Abney Cultural Center Auditorium. I am Lucas McMillan, Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. If you are not normally on our campus, we especially welcome you here tonight. Tonight we are gathered to consider the broad array of ways in which we can be active as citizens. And this panel is the second event in our series entitled Achieving the Promise. This is a project supported by a grant from South Carolina Humanities, the state level organization that distributes funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm so pleased that this series is part of a national democracy and the informed citizen initiative that is spearheaded by the Federation of State Humanities Councils of which South Carolina Humanities is a member. Yesterday was for voting. I hope you earned a sticker as I did. Tonight's discussion ensures that we understand that citizens must and should do much more than show up on election day. We can and must work together to advocate for better communities, activities that may be a part of established organizations or may require the establishment of a new group, a new network, or a new organization. I am so pleased that our panelists tonight showcase that civic engagement is far beyond the halls of government. But I'm even more excited that they illustrate for you that local, state, and national activism comes from diverse organizations and in some cases has emerged through their own entrepreneurial spirit. Citizens can be and should be entrepreneurs of advocacy and activism based on the needs of a community. And we know that community exists at the local level, state level, national, and even international level. And communities need consistent nourishment from active citizens. So my thanks to our panelists for their participation, and especially to Ashley Woodwiss, my colleague who is project director for this grant and who, with us, helps us inspire, engage, and enrich the lives of South Carolinians through this grant series that we have supported this year. I hope you will return to our campus for more events in this series, and I know that you, like me, join in welcoming our panelists tonight. Turn it over to our chair of the panel, Ashley Woodwiss. Thank you, Lucas, and welcome everybody to uh, this evening's event. I'll keep my comments uh, brief because if you want to hear the stories from these panels. Regardless of the results yesterday, we all know that something is not right in the American Democratic household. According to the Pew Research Center, only 18% of Americans today say that they can trust the government in Washington to do what is right most of the time. That's the bad news. The good news is there is a civic renewal happening in our country, a renewal across our nation in cities of all sizes, in all regions of our country. And that's the goal for tonight's panel, to provide hope in this difficult time in our national life, and to perhaps serve as a guide and inspiration for our own future efforts. Good community building, community serving, good work is being done. As we engage our local communities as fellow citizens, sharing the same space and place, committed together to its health, a certain civic promise comes into view. Perhaps we together can rebuild the democratic household. The civic renewal that I mentioned goes by a name called the new localism. This represents a real paradigm shift in the way of thinking about our civic responsibilities. Authors Jeremy Katz and Bruce Nowick have written a book entitled The New Localism, and they describe how civic councils, organically formed groups of local officials, business leaders, neighborhood organizations, are making profound and beneficial impacts on our local communities. Members of such citizen groups may have different racial, class, and partisan identities, but they have one shared identity, the love of their local community. So this movement, this new localism, 
is about practical problem solving, not partisan politics. This is what we mean by tonight's topic, civic engagement. As New York Times columnist David Brooks put it, localism brings conservatives and liberals together around the thought that people are happiest when their lives are enmeshed in caring face-to-face -face relationships, building their communities together. Civic engagement, the topic for tonight, thus reflects a posture and a commitment. The posture is that of the citizen who sees others different from them not as foes or as fellow combatants, but as fellow citizens, and who are committed to work with their fellow citizens to better their community. Tonight, we will hear from a diverse set of such civic engagers. Tonight's not about politics, as Luke has said. It's about the sharing of our civic life together and how we might make it better for all of us. How do we engage our communities with all of our differences in class, and race, gender, religion, and ideology? How do we engage it as citizens committed to our community's well-being and health? These panelists are people who each day engage, serve, and strengthen their communities. This is their work, and they are good at it. And we will benefit from hearing their stories, and if we have the ears to hear, they will open our civic imaginations to consider what role we might play. So this is the game plan. Each participant has been asked to tell their story of how they came into their work and what their work is all about. And you have a program, and you can read about them in that program. After the last presentation, the panel will have a discussion among ourselves. And then we have two mics set up for the audience to join the conversation after that. It'll be a time for us all to engage. So let's get the evening started by welcoming to Lander, to Lander University former U.S. Representative Mr. Bob Inglis, founder and executive director of Republican. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Um, so, we're um, I'm running this outfit called RepublicEN.org, and our community is a group we hope growing very much of conservatives concerned about climate change. Um, now, some of you may be thinking that isn't a thing. Right? A conservative cares about climate change, but we're out to prove that it is a thing, that there are many of us. And so um, I, I'm sort of an unlikely person for that based on my first six years in Congress, because during my first six years in Congress, I said that climate change was nonsense. I didn't know anything about it except that Al Gore was for it. Um, and that was the end of the inquiry for me. <laughs> and if you represented Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, in the U.S. Congress, that would probably be the end of inquiry for you too, because uh, it's probably the reddest district and the reddest state in the nation. I will tell you that Republican.org, I travel a lot. I was recently in Idaho, and I sort of pulled that punch because I wasn't sure I could maintain in Idaho that we were redder than they were. So there are some places, Idaho, Texas, where I don't make that boast, but here I think I can say. Pretty red district, right? Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina. So that's my first six years in Congress. I admit that's fairly ignorant uh, to base it only on Al Gore being for it, therefore I'm against it. I'm a Republican, therefore I'm against it. But that's the way it was for six years. Uh, then I was out of Congress for six years um, uh, and doing commercial real estate law again in Greenville. Um, I had the opportunity to run for Congress yet again in 2004 uh, with the hope of becoming a recidivist. Um, and uh, so I, I was right in 04, my son came to me, the eldest of our five children. He just turned 18, so he was voting for the first time, and he said to me, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. It's the first of the three-step metamorphosis for me. By the way, my son was going to vote for me no matter what, right? I mean, what if we'd lost about one vote? It wasn't in his economic interest to vote against me. I mean, he was... Uh, uh, so. He, and he wasn't making a classic interest group threat either. He was really saying, Dad, I love you. And you can be better than you were before, so how about make this English 2.0, the new and improved version? 
Um, and by the way, his four sisters agreed, his mother agreed, a new constituency is born. That constituency is people can change the locks and the doors. You really want to respond to them very, very carefully. Um, and so um, that was step one of this three-step metamorphosis for me. Second step was going to Antarctica with the Science Committee and seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. Um, uh, we can go into that if you want to. Uh, third step was another Science Committee trip uh, and something of a spiritual awakening which, wait a minute, that's impossible, right? A godless science committee trip and a spiritual awakening? All scientists are godless, right? Um, well, apparently not, because um, this Aussie climate scientist was showing us uh, the glories of the reef and uh, Great Barrier Reef and uh, an impact of, coral, of climate change on corals, uh, coral bleaching. Know in that if you want to. Um, and I could tell that he and I shared a world view before any words were spoken. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. So Scott Heron was preaching the gospel. I could see it in his eyes, I could hear it in his voice, as he told me about things that he would show me when he'd go down and come to the service, he'd be all excited. I could see that he was worshiping God. He wasn't worshiping the creation, he was worshiping the creator behind the God of the creation, and I knew it. So later we had a chance to talk, and he told me about conservation changes he was making in his life in order to love God and love people. People who will never know because they'll come after us. Um, some of my conservative friends think it's sort of silly what he does, but he rides his bike to work. He tries to do it without air conditioning in Townsville, Australia, a pretty hot place, as long as his wife and three daughters will let him get away with it. He tries to do it without the electric dryer. All these things to consciously love people coming after us. So I got right inspired. I want to be like Scott, loving God and loving people. He's now a very dear friend. So I came home and introduced the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act of 2009 in the U.S. Congress. Note to self, do not introduce carbon tax in midst of great recession, in reddest district of reddest state of nation. It will not go well. And it did not go well at all. After 12 years in Congress, and a Republican runoff, I got 29% of the vote, and the other guy got 71% of the vote. That is a spectacular face plant in politics. Um, so at that point, a foundation came to me and said, you know, Inglis, you are an unusual zoo animal. An actual conservative of a 93 American Conservative Union rating, 100% Christian Coalition, 100% National Right to Life, A with the NRA, zero with the Americans for Democratic Action, that's a liberal group, and 23 by some mistake with the AFL, CIO, a labor union, I was really hoping for a zero. Um, and so uh, there's an actual conservative who says climate change is real, will you speak and write for the proposition? And that's what I've been doing ever since, because I'm out to prove that conservatives have an answer here. So far, conservatives shrink in science denial when the question of climate change comes up. Apparently, we think we're no good at energy and climate. But we're very good. We got the answer. We know it. It's to basically put all the cost in on all the fuels, eliminate all the subsidies, and then in that transparent, accountable marketplace, watch the free enterprise system drive innovation. And so um, we now have uh, six people, um, three, two in DC, one in Wisconsin, one in California, two of us live and work from here in South Carolina. Um, I continue to live in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, and work from there. Um, and we facilitate a community, an online community, about 6,000 people that needs to grow to 60,000 and then 600,000 in order for us to be successful in finding 25 House Republicans and 15 Senate Republicans to support meaningful climate action by 2022. That's our singular goal. So it's all about building a community that feels supported and empowered to go out and proclaim the good news that we got a solution, yes we do, we got a solution, how about you? Um, so far, you don't remember that school from the middle school chair, don't you? Um, uh, and so, so far what we have is conservatives shrinking in science denial and avoiding the data, which is a rather strange place for us to be. Um, so we want to encourage conservatives to stand up and to venture on their great ideas about how do you innovate? Well, you fix economics and then uh, 
the environmental problem take care of itself. So um, I look forward to your questions and uh, comments about that community. Um, it is essential to find a way to put people together so that they feel a little bit supported. Uh, the problem right now is the dominant voice is um, one of dis disputation of, the of science. Um, I would offer you this encouragement though and then sit down. If it seems to you like political orthodoxies are quite fixed, they're actually quite fluid. And uh, a community, a relatively small community like ours, we think can change that narrative. So for example, I got in some trouble when I was in Congress for voting against the troop surge in Iraq. Uh, I've been to Iraq five times, been to Afghanistan four times. I knew that the U.S. military could do it, but I had conservative concerns that my friend, and he is my friend, George W. Bush, was doing nation building in Iraq. So I voted against the troop surge. Channel 4 uh, filmed somebody at one of my events shortly thereafter saying, I scraped your sticker off my Cadillac. Um, uh, how dare you vote against our president? So that was uh, a while back, right? Fast forward a little bit. Ron Paul, not ran, but Ron ran for president. He had 25% of the Republican primary vote. He wasn't just against the troop surge. He was against the whole thing. Fast forward a little bit further, and President Donald Trump trashes the whole effort in Iraq about once a month. So what appeared to be a very fixed orthodoxy of intervention under George W. Bush is now what appears to be a very fixed orthodoxy of isolationism under Donald J. Trump. That's oddly encouraging, I hope. In other words, if you don't like the way it is right now, it's still like the weather. Just wait a while. It'll get better, right? Except for the case of climate. That's the long term. we got to fix that. So look forward to your questions and comments. move from a global issue like climate change to a painfully at-home issue in the issue of autism. Lisa Lane and Susan Sachs, co-founders and executive directors of the Project Hope Foundation, will tell us their story. Good evening. My name is Susan Sachs, and along with Lisa Lane, we are the founders and executive directors of Project Hope Foundation, a nonprofit organization that has been in existence for 22 years with a mission of providing a life span of autism services. We serve children as young as 12 months of age who are just getting that diagnosis of autism up through adults some of whom may need help with those most basic life skills, while others simply need help with finding and keeping a job. As you probably know, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder that significantly impacts one's ability to communicate and to interact with the world. Many of these folks have odd, difficult, disrupt disruptive, sometimes even destructive behaviors. If you watch TV, there's a lot about autism on TV right now, so you may watch The Good Doctor, and you may know that when he becomes upset, he covers his ears or flaps his hands. Some folks actually hurt themselves. They have what's called self-injurious behaviors. You may know some of these things about autism, but there are some things that you may not know, but that you should know. Over 30% of those individuals with autism are nonverbal. That means that they will never speak. They can't say, I'm hungry, I hurt, I need a bathroom. Individuals with autism are five times more likely to be bullied than their typical counterparts. 50% of them will wander away. They don't set out to run away, they simply wander off and get lost. Can't find their way back because they don't understand danger or boundaries. And if you listen to the news, then you know situations like this can have very catastrophic, sometimes even deadly, consequences. 84% will live as, a, as adults, they will live at home with their families, with their parents, at least until their parents are no longer 
able to take care of them or aren't there to take care of them. And that leads to another huge problem, and that is the lack of appropriate housing for adults on the spectrum. 92% of adults with autism will be unemployed, despite the fact that they have skills and talents that would make them great employees. When Lisa and I started Project Hope Foundation 22 years ago, the rate of autism was 1 in 2,500. Today, that rate is 1 in 59 and we still don't know why. We know that it's not just better diagnostics and improved increased awareness. Even the CDC says that those factors cannot account entirely for this epidemic increase. And though we don't know the cause of autism, we do know that it is the fastest growing severe developmental disability in the United States, that boys are four times more likely to have autism than girls, that currently there is no medical test or medical cure for autism, and that without appropriate treatment, these folks are likely to require lifelong care. And that care is estimated conservatively to cost $2.4 million per person. So you see, autism doesn't just affect the child and the family. Autism affects each and every one of us in this room because eventually we will all be taxpayers and that is one of the places that it will affect us is our wallets. But there is good news. There is a treatment that can change the trajectory of the lives of these children and their families and impact the effect that autism will have on our community. And that treatment is called Applied Behavior Analysis or ABA Therapy. ABA therapy is widely recognized as the best practices treatment for children with autism. It's an intensive therapy. It's a one-on-one -on -one therapy. One child working with one therapist at a time. And each child receiving 25 to 40 hours every week of this ABA therapy. That's like a three-year-old having a, a full-time job. But the good news is that this, th this therapy has phenomenal results. Things like 95% of our clients gain significant measurable skills. Skills like learning to communicate. Life-changing skills. 48% will mainstream into regular classrooms without any additional support. That's almost unheard of in the, de in the developmental delay community. And even more exciting, if we can begin to treat these kids and provide them with ABA therapy before they turn three, that 48% becomes an astounding 86%. 86% not requiring $2.4 million in lifelong care. 86% able to live normal, happy, independent, productive lives. So Susan talked to you about sort of what our engagement is. But the reason that we came to this level of civic engagement is because we're moms. So this was thrust upon us. One of my sons actually works here at Lander. He's Rickson Lane. He's with your, uh, the sports information director with your athletic department. My other son, Colby, like Susan's son, Michael, had a period of time of normal development. Everything was going great. And then, Suddenly, things fell apart. He stopped looking at me. He stopped making noises. He stopped having facial expression. Susan had a similar situation with her son, Michael, who was a few years older. And so that galvanized us into action. We left our separate careers. Susan in social work, I had been an attorney. And we came together not knowing each other before then, but just having a common need with some parents to form a nonprofit, a local nonprofit, which we call Project Hope Foundation. Hope for us was an acronym for Help Our Potential Emerge because we knew buried within those children who were no longer responding to us were people that we wanted to get to know, people who had huge things to give to the world. And so we started small with our nonprofit. We started with a small program and we grew over the past 22 years so that now we have a lifespan of services, as Susan mentioned, ranging from the therapy, that ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis Therapy, 
to classrooms, to adult services. So on a daily basis, we are impacting about 300 individuals and their families. And I've had the opportunity to work with thousands of people over the past two decades. So our, our role in the world was given to us. Our mission was handed to us. But I want to talk to you a little bit about how we have joined with other families in the grassroots efforts of those families and friends and community like yours that has made a difference in the world of autism in sort of a good news, bad news way. The Applied Behavior Analysis Therapy, that ABA therapy that Susan said, is the best medically accepted treatment for, for folks with autism and has those phenomenal results, was not covered by insurance. That means that almost no families could access something that we knew could change lives. 50%, 48% going into mainstream life. Learning to speak, learning to engage in the world, and where there was no access because people couldn't, couldn't afford it. As we were trying to, uh, to provide that even as a nonprofit, which you're looking at 40 hours a week, of therapy for several years, that's something that almost no, no family has the expendable income to cover. And so a group of families across the state gathered together to try to get insurance coverage mandated in the state of South Carolina, meaning insurance companies would have to cover it. Uh, that group came together around, um, under the leadership of several moms, one of whom had a child named Ryan. And so it became Ryan's Law Initiative, trying to get this coverage. Uh, and about 2005 started a approaching the legislature and the lobbyists to see what we could do. It was a learning experience for us all. We were not political beings, and so had to sort of learn how to try to get our message across, which is a difficult thing to do when your message is complicated. Uh, we were fortunate to get into offices and have the ear of many politicians, but um, the lobbyist against this was very strong. And so we were not able to pass through that, that that law in our first efforts. And so out of that, we learned that sometimes compromise emerges. And so the legislature came back with a compromise measure of going to Medicaid to try to get coverage for this therapy through a waiver, which means we're not usually covered under our Medicaid system, but we'll get a, a, a special waiver to cover this. That was fabulous news, fabulous news. We were thrilled, and so we opened up our ABA branch. We were poised and ready to get started providing this therapy to people. And then came the bad news, because that waiver had a lot of limitations. It was only going to cover children from age 3 to age 10. It would only cover children for a period of three years. And worst of all, as it was implemented, it was going to be a lottery system. So people, children's names were written and put into a hat and drawn out. So of the thousands of children who needed this across the state, which couple of hundred were going to get plucked from that hat? As you can imagine, that was a very difficult thing for this grassroots coalition to, to gather around when we've all been working together, your child's getting benefit, your child didn't make it. That's a tough situation. So the good news was that those several hundred children did get therapy and did start making um, progress, and it was exciting to see. And the families, thankfully, across the state and across the spectrum rallied back around. So we went back to battle to say, really, 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 this waiver is great, but we've got to have insurance coverage. And I'm excited to say that this was a bipartisan effort, and we got the, the um, coverage passed, said that it went into effect about 2007. Fabulous news. Insurance would now cover this medical treatment that children needed. But there were also glitches there, because not every, every insurance company has to abide by mandates in the state of South Carolina. So if your family was insured through a large company that was self-insured, they didn't have to abide by this. If you got your insurance through a company that had less than 50 employees, they didn't have to abide by this. 
If your company was uh, headquartered out of state, they didn't have to buy by this. So still huge gaps in who was going to get covered. So we have since then continued to rally back around, learning our way about how to make our needs known, to be a voice for this group who is not able to speak for themselves. And uh, we spent even last year back trying to, to get some of those gaps filled so that everyone who has insurance could use that insurance to get this medically necessary therapy covered. And then something new happened. Medicaid came around, and uh, national Medicaid sent out a memo to all the states to say, you know what, actually, this therapy should be covered through Medicaid as well. That's fabulous news. Because almost everyone in our community has access to Medicaid because of their diagnosis. So suddenly the door could swing open for everyone zero to 21 years of age to get this therapy, no more caps on how many years, no more caps on what age you uh, could start, zero to 21. Fabulous news. And then we realized what the rates were going to be. The reimbursement rates that they were going to give us were the same rates that our therapists, when we had gotten started way back when, were making. It was an unsustainable rate. Nobody could work for it. So as a nonprofit, we did go ahead and start taking Medicaid clients in good faith, thinking we'll get this worked out. You know, we've, it's got to, we've got to move forward, but surely this will get paid for uh, because $2.4 million per child to take care of these folks as adults versus some influx of cash to let them learn the skills they need to be part of our community. So this started in 2015. We started taking Medicaid clients and talked with our um, legislators and talked with the agency that runs Medicaid Health and Human Services here in South Carolina. 2016, 2017, we continued to run up a deficit as a nonprofit trying to provide the services that we knew needed to be given despite the fact that we weren't getting reimbursed. And so finally we did get um, a chance to, to talk with the legislators enough to get a, a significant increase pushed through the agency last year. That's great news. Fabulous news. The bad news is that it is not the amount that we had already put out. That this is this is the bottom dollar for which we, as a nonprofit, can do this therapy and um, keep ourselves from completely going under. So we'll be back. We'll be back talking with our folks um, this year, both to try to fill in those insurance gaps and to get that rate up for the therapy that we know these kids need. Now, thousands of kids, over 2,000 kids on a waiting list. And we'll be back then to come back to say, we also now need to talk to you about adult services. Our sons are 24 and 26, still need support. And about employment services for these young adults. And then for housing, as these adults outlive their parents and need a place to live. So our community engagement has been very focused by where we are in life but it has broadened our scope of many, many people who have joined this fight, not because they have to, but because they want to. And that has been, a, I think, a gift to us to see what can happen when people join together to try to make good things occur. Thank you. Well, I think the students, you all can already realize the profound variety and depth of the good work that's out there to be done. We've had a former member of Congress with a burden to help spread the word among his people about climate change. We've heard two mothers talk about the burden of their own situation, of their own children, their own sons, and to work to try to help not just their own sons, but all similarly situated. Our next speaker, Reverend Chris Thomas, also has a burden, a burden for us to remember and to not forget. Chris Thomas, director for Dr. Benjamin May's Historical Preservation Site. I want to 
will start tonight by just sort of explaining to you in the name of our organization. We are called the Gleams, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays Historic Preservation Site. Um, our parent company is a company called Gleams. It's an acronym for Greenwood, Lawrence, Edgefield, Abbeville, McCormick, Newberry, and Saluda. They are the counties that our agency originally served. Uh, Gleams is a community action agency. Uh, it is one of the agencies uh, in our state. It's one of the oldest community action agencies and it was formed for the purpose of attacking and addressing poverty in, every, in, in each way that it manifests itself in the counties that we serve. And so uh, Gleams goes about the business through several programs of attacking and addressing poverty uh, throughout the counties that we serve, although we serve actually more counties that are in our original acronym now. And so uh, in 2011, um, our former CEO, Dr. Joseph Patton, had worked tirelessly with some other folks in the community to move Dr. Mays' uh, childhood home and his birth home to our site. Uh, they also then moved a school called the Burn Spring School. They built a uh, museum to honor Dr. Mays. And so our site now um, also goes about the business of teaching and talking about the legacy uh, and life of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. It is a fitting cooperation between the two entities because Dr. Mays also spent the majority of his life working to do the same thing. Uh, Dr. Mays wanted to end uh, both poverty and he also wanted to end Southern segregation. Dr. Mays was born August 1st of 1894 in our county to two parents that were both ex-slaves and um, Dr. Mays uh, was born at a time where whites were going about the business in our state of reestablishing white rule. And so Dr. Mays' early life was very troubled by uh, much of the violence uh, that existed here in Greenwood County and throughout our state uh, that was inflicted upon the African American community. And Dr. Mays, uh, his first earliest struggle in life was that he deeply wanted to get an education. And for him, uh, being what they then called a Negro male, born in what he said uh, was, uh, he said he was born into respectable poverty in the backwoods of South Carolina. And uh, how he was going to get an education was very uh, unknown to him and probably to anyone around him, but he had a great desire to get one. Uh, Dr. Mays, though, in his childhood, he enters uh, the Brickhouse School at age five, but uh, Dr. Mays, like many, uh, or pretty much all African American males in our state at that time, was subject to going to school in the sharecropping system that existed. And so Dr. Mays would actually only go to school four months a year his whole life uh, until he was uh, 18 years of age and he would finally decide to leave the farm. And uh, this put Dr. Mays at a disadvantage. Dr. Mays was also very driven because uh, Dr. Mays was very bothered at that time uh, by what uh, was the doctrine of black inferiority that existed here in the South. And it was a doctrine that said that blacks were, uh, by nature of their birth, that they were inferior to whites. And this bothered Dr. Mays greatly. In fact, Dr. Mays once told his saintly mother, Lavinia, he said, Mama, if God had made me inferior, Dr. Mays said, I never could pray to a God like that. Um, this concerned his mother, but what Dr. Mays was really saying is he just simply did not believe that God had made him inferior. And Dr. Mays wanted an opportunity to be able to prove uh, that he was as mentally capable as any man. But he said he couldn't do that here in the South, so he gets this dream as a young man of going north. He wanted to go and compete with the minds of these intelligent white northerners he heard so much about. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mays finally eventually will have an opportunity to do that. Uh, but Dr. Mays' childhood was also very bothered by another aspect of life here. Uh, he attended a church uh, called Old Mount Zion Church. It's still in existence down in the Epworth community. And Dr. Mays was very bothered by his childhood pastor. Uh, Reverend James Foster Marshall, who had done a tremendous job uh, pastoring up to 18 churches. Uh, he built schools at, at three of these churches, the school Dr. Mays would attend, or the two schools he would attend, the Brickhouse School from age 5 to 15, and then the Bethany Colored School that was in McCormick that was behind Bethany Baptist Church. His pastor built these churches. Uh, but Dr. Mays was very bothered by uh, not just him, but what he called uh, the typical Afro-Baptist preacher in the South at that time. He said that they would preach a great message that would get the people all excited uh, but he said that they were doing nothing to affect the lives of the people that were poor and living in Southern segregation. And so Dr. Mays, I think, at some point was very uh, troubled by his own calling to the ministry, but he goes off his first year to college in Virginia, and then he gets an opportunity to, to, to fulfill his childhood dream, to go to Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. And there Dr. Mays comes in contact uh, with the doctrine of the social gospel and a man named Walter Rochenbaugh. 
And uh, Dr. Mace finds in this what he'd always wanted, and that was a cross-segment uh, of a ministry that could allow him to fight against what he always despised, and that was Southern segregation. And this is how Dr. Mays began the business uh, of engaging the society around him, that he wanted to have a ministry, both uh, when he finally gets his PhD and becomes the dean of the School of Religion at Howard University, uh, and then later in 1940 when he becomes the, the uh, president of Morehouse uh, in 1940. And Dr. Mays would go about the business uh, of attacking Southern segregation. In fact, when he uh, leaves Washington, D.C., he was asked why would he come back south with all the, slave, all the, the segregation and all the racism. And Dr. Mays said, well, the South is where my people are, and it's where I can do the most good. And so Dr. Mays went about the business of engaging the society around him. He became, uh, he was one of the last of, 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 a, of a dying breed of men that were both clergymen and college presidents. And Dr. Mays was really almost like the pastor of Morehouse College uh, for, for, for 27 years. And uh, he raises up this generation of men to assist him with the work that he always wanted to do, and that was to end Southern segregation. And so I've come to that work now that although that period in life is somewhat past, we still have some struggles, um, but I've taken on the business uh, of, of engaging society around me to help what Dr. Mays wanted to help, and that was African American men. And we started an initiative called the Mays Scholars Program. And what our intent is, our goal is, we still to this day see African American males, African American boys as early as preschool struggle greatly in our public schools. And so we want to go about the business of, in the Mays tradition, raising up African American males. And we have this aggressive goal in 10 years to create 100 African American male school teachers from Greenwood County uh, who are raised up in the, in the Mays tradition of, of, of educator clergymen. And so these young men are going about the business of learning the life of Mays and Howard Thurman uh, and all of the, the men that came to Morehouse that were part of the social gospel tradition that created both Morehouse and Howard Divinity Schools. We're going to be going next week, next Thursday, to the uh, Howard Thurman Crown Forum series at Morehouse. And we're exposing these young men uh, to, to a, a history and a legacy that they probably will not get in our public schools now. Uh, and and it's, it's something that I'm impassioned about. Uh, how I personally came to this work, I've been in the ministry now uh, for 28 years, seems like just about my whole adult life, uh, the greater portion of it was spent in youth ministry. Uh, I was a, a youth minister, I was a college basketball player, and so I coached uh, uh, middle school basketball for uh, a good period of time in, in Sacramento, California, and so I've always worked with young people, and I've always worked with young African American males, and I, and I see um, their struggles uh, and the things that they go through, and I, 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 so I understand greatly why uh, I think that the number here in Greenwood County is like 30% of our African American males drop out of our public school, and I understand the challenges that makes them uh, drop out of school. And so I, I am continuing the work of Dr. Mays. Uh, Dr. Mays said at Morehouse, he said that he told the young men there that he said he didn't come to Morehouse to create doctors or lawyers uh, or educators. He said he came to create men. And for 27 years, Dr. Mays did that. He went about the business of creating some of the most profound African-American men that our society has ever seen. Of course, the greatest of those that you all would know is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Mays was his mentor. Uh, it has been said by many people that without Benjamin Elijah Mays, there would not have been a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He had that profound an impact on King. In fact, his wife, Coretta Scott King, said that uh, it was under the leadership of his spiritual father, uh, Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, the president of Morehouse College, that Martin received his call to the ministry. She said that uh, Dr. Mays took an interest in Martin from the first to the last and ultimately set his life on the path that it would take. She met the ministry. Dr. King actually came to Morehouse with the intention of being uh, of studying sociology and then going into law school and becoming an attorney. And he saw in this larger-than-life man, Benjamin Elijah Mays, what he also had always wanted, and that was an intellectual ministry that he could impact the world around him. And uh, it is our goal, our mission now, to create men in that uh, legacy uh, and to get them an understanding of, of what that means to be uh, a Benjamin Mays type person or like a Morehouse man. Thank you. I want to ask the panelists to do uh, is really for you students. You all will leave Lander University hopefully with a passion and a burden to not only get well-paying jobs and live successful lives, but to serve your community, to be public servants. 
to engage with your communities. And we've heard three very different accounts of how to engage communities. But in each one, if you were listening carefully, in each one, what you heard were individuals who have a burden, who have something that weighs on their hearts and minds and won't let them go. And something else you heard is how being involved in the work that they are involved in opens them up and expands them. And so my first question to my colleagues up here is, can you address that? Help us all understand how you've been changed by the work that you, in a sense, have been called to do. I think when Lisa and I started what we were doing, I think we started it really kind of selfishly. We started it because we needed something for our kids, something that would give them a future. But what happens throughout that process of helping our own children, we began to see what that entire community need was. There literally was nothing out there except families and children who desperately needed help. So that selfish mission, I think if you had asked us at that time, we would have said maybe three years and then we need to get back to what we used to do. I've never regretted one day continuing this mission because what you find is a sense of purpose, that sense of getting up in the morning and looking in the mirror and knowing that you're making a difference not only to your own child, but to other people's children. Those children and their families become part of your family. So I think it changes your entire perspective. I can't imagine a life where service was not part of it. I don't know what the meaning would be if service were not part of it. Dismiss. We can leave now. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Bob. Yeah, I, I, think that, I think that's very true. That, um, the, the, what one should hope for in a career is something big enough to be about. And the thing I loved about being in Congress was every day was filled with mission and purpose. Um, and so what I find in this work is it's certainly big enough to be about um, as we try to head off really some serious consequences of climate change that are coming our way. So it's, it's surely big enough to be about. And particularly for uh, young people here, you know, um, you and I weren't around when they wrote the Constitution. Uh, uh, you weren't around and I was too young to march in, in Selma. But you can be there when we solve climate change. So it's really quite an incredible calling and an opportunity. I think what you can see is whether it's climate change or it's racism or it's autism, um, what we have found is that the antidote to despair that can come from any of those circumstances and hopelessness and frustration is action. And so moving forward with action, I think, is not only beneficial for, for the cause itself, but it changes the person who's trying to deal with those emotions surrounding the cause. I want to, I guess, tell a story so you can understand how it has impacted me. Uh, we were going to have a jazz concert at our site a little more than a year ago. There was a young lady that lived in the community that had come and bought tickets to the concert and we ended up uh, not having the concert, and, but uh, the young lady kept coming back several times to talk to me about stuff. And um, we were talking about her potential uh, possibilities in her own life. And uh, she finally shared with me that she had uh, dropped out of school. And so we had this conversation about how she could go back and I gave her some online sources, she could go back and get her uh, high school diploma and so forth and so on. And every time I would give her something to do, she just wouldn't do it. And then uh, she would show back up again and then finally she showed up and I guess I was looking a little salty. And so she said, Mr. Thomas, you probably think I'm a sorry person, don't you? And I really, in my heart, was thinking, yeah, I do. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, she said, well, I just want to tell you the truth. She said, I can't read. And my mouth dropped, you know, I, I said, how? is this young lady, you know, in her early 30s, and she has three or four children, uh, and here she is, she went through Greenwood District 50 schools, and she's telling me that she cannot read. Um, but what it did is it gave me the courage to take on and fight some of the fights that I'm fighting 
because sometimes there are people even in our society that seem so advanced and seem so doing so well that have just simply slipped between the cracks um, and there's no voice out there for them or for their families uh, and so I, I've made it a point to just be bold in the things that I say and to not worry if I offend, offend anyone or people might not understand what I'm saying uh, because people may not know that there's a young lady that lives around the corner that went to Greenwood District 50 schools and she's 31 or 32 years old and cannot read. And so uh, I, I've gone about the business of doing what I do with a sense of boldness uh, to, and courage to do it. And that's how I think it's changed me the most. All of us who are committed to the work that we do in, in any length of time, we learn something about ourselves. Uh, there's a, a kind of self-revelation, I think, that's involved in this, this committed work that we're about. So what, what hidden skills or what hidden qualities of character have you learned are necessary for the work that you're doing that perhaps you didn't realize when you were getting started? Well, I think it's obvious to, to look at what we do in working with folks with autism and, and know that you absolutely have to have patience. You have to have compassion, not just for the folks who have autism, but for their families and for their extended community. Those are skills that you absolutely have to have. But I think some of those character skills that come out that I guess I, I had to learn, I learned that money cannot buy everything. Money cannot fix everything. And I guess doing what I used to do, I thought it could. I, I thought having a good job and making lots of money and being able to do all the things that I like to do, that was the answer to what I wanted out of life. And then Michael came along. And suddenly my perfect little boy wouldn't look at me, wouldn't make eye contact with me. He didn't call me mama for two years. And I, I didn't know the amount of money I could come up with was going to fix him. But there was a therapy that could. So that, that figuring out what was important to me, that was the thing I think I learned most is what, what really mattered in my life. What was I willing to do to do it, to get that? Um, that was one of the hard questions. I begged. I wrote letters to people I didn't even know asking for help because he needed that help. So figuring out who you are, what you're willing to do, and what really matters were those parts of me that I discovered in the process. I think for me, um, it, it, it was learning to love. Uh, I think that if you don't love the people to whom you're serving, uh, what you're doing is very, very difficult because a lot of times it work like this, it, it can't be for the money because there's no money there, at least in my, at least in my line of work. Uh, and, and so you, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, you have to, to, to love the people and the work that you're doing. Um, when I was a student, uh, I, I was a philosophy undergrad major and then I got a graduate degree in English and then I went to law school. So I loved words and I love language and I especially loved arguing. I love debating. I loved trying to get my point across. Um, that was what I saw as, as just sort of the height of communication. So I have learned through uh, a lot of tutelage under my son Colby's uh, guidance that that is not the essence of communication. Uh, I, I shared with some of you, I had a chance to talk to a class here not long ago that Colby, when he was a little boy, uh, nonverbal till the age of eight, but uh, every once in a while would throw some words out at me that I would uh, treasure. And one of those was as we were riding along and he spouts out, circles have corners. Right? Kobe knows circles. He knew the shapes and colors of letters. That he knew well. <sighs> corners have circles. Circles have corners. Cor corners with circles. And my old self would have really wanted to say, uh oh, nobody. No, no, no. Let me explain this to you. Let me show you one more time. Let's go through some more drills. Let me see if I could teach it to you again. My better self, having learned under Kobe, 
was that communication means stopping and listening and pausing and waiting until someone gets their point across. And so he looks out the window and he points at those road signs that are shaped like this, you know, 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. They have corners with circles, also called rounded edges. So um, through Colby, I have learned that I can argue my point and be right, or I can stop and listen and maybe figure out something from another point of view that I never would have gotten. I think one thing that I've learned is uh, the importance of diplomacy. Um, and that may seem strange in today's world of politics, particularly because it seems like we're not terribly diplomatic. And in fact, people who are diplomatic are seen as double speakers. And you just gotta tell them what you think. Um, well, um, I think that's an aberration. I think we're gonna find out that that's, that doesn't really work. Because how, how's it work in your life? You know, if you walk up to somebody and tell them, gee, your nose is big, how do you think that's going to work for you? Um, you know, it probably ain't going to work too well. Um, and so um, it's, uh, I think, I'm, I'm holding on to the hope that we're in an aberrant period uh, in our political discourse especially, because diplomacy really is important. Um, and I tell you, it's not just, well, just being able to, uh, it's, it's part of what was just said, it's being able to listen to somebody else and empathize with them and then figure out how to gently lead and uh, advance the point. Um, because um, otherwise things are just too abrupt and the, and the result is you get pushback and you get a real uh, stopping point. And so, um, but like I say, it seems like that's, that doesn't seem to be in being exercised right now, does it? So you're probably thinking, English, I don't know what planet you're talking about or what year period of time you're talking about. But I'm here to predict that it will come back to that because it's just sort of normal human interaction is you have to figure out a way to control what you say. I will tell you that I find an exception to this. It's not just two-year-olds. You know, I used to tell people, uh, two-year-olds say whatever they want to say, you know, and whatever they want to think. Um, it's also true that uh, first graders, you know, you go to a first grader and they'll ask you anything when you're, uh, in the class, you know, they'll, they'll literally ask you, why is your nose so long or something, you know? Um, and so I will tell you, there's another class of people I've found who do the same thing. Um, and it, it is uh, some donor kind of people that are billionaires. And the reason I think is that they have no one around them to tell them, you really shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, because they're, they've gotten so isolated in their world of great wealth. I was just at Bill Gates' personal office. Now, I didn't get to see him, but, and I don't know whether he's this way. But I did understand that if you're in a meeting with him, there are two diet Pepsis. Don't touch them. They're his. Well, now, isn't that sort of strange? <laughs> I mean, if there are two diet Pepsis here, it's like, I would assume one's for you, one's for me, maybe, right? But don't touch them. Um, uh, so, you know, and if you live in that world, you get to the place where you think, oh yeah, the world is set up for me to have two Pepsis and none for you. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I shouldn't pick on him. I don't know, maybe he's a very delightful fellow. I just haven't ever met with him. I know this, I was, in, I was at Duke with his wife but before she became his wife. I wish I'd been more friendly to that Melinda gal. Um, <laughs> maybe she would have cut me in on a little company called Microsoft early on. <laughs> I didn't know her, I didn't know her, so it wasn't that I wasn't unfriendly to her, I just didn't know. I didn't know Melinda, I don't know where, what her maiden name was. <laughs> yeah, really. I just want to ask a couple more questions of the panelists, and then we want to throw it open. Uh, so be thinking of a question that you want to ask either a particular member of the panel or the panel as a whole. Uh, I want to move kind of civically uh, in this uh, next uh, question. As you make your way through your communities, whatever size, whatever definition, what kinds of issues or challenges or rewards have you encountered? It 
as you move through the autism community, it's, it's just a bunch of challenges. <laughs> that's just kind of part of, that's really part of what it is. So as you move through that community, one of the challenges that we face is that we absolutely know that what we're doing can make a difference. We absolutely know that with the therapy that our kids receive that we can change lives. But every day we receive phone calls from parents who want access to that ABA therapy, but they don't have the funding to be able to get that therapy. And as a nonprofit, we can't, if, I guarantee you that if, if I had won that $1.6 billion, our families could have access to that therapy. That was part of our lottery plan. But the fact of the matter is, is we have over 250 employees that we have to pay. We have families that we have to serve. So the ability to, to have that therapy is, is, is a limitation by money and by personnel. That's another thing that we face is we need more employees. So as you graduate and you're looking for a career, we'd love to talk with you about working with kids and adults with autism. It's about as rewarding an occupation as you can you can get because you get up every morning and know that you make a difference. The rewards, those are countless as well. Because we see kids, we mainstreamed 13 children last year from our, eight, from our school program into mainstream education, into mainstream life. We have seen families falling apart who have regrouped. The divorce rate is 85% and above for these families who deal with autism. So we've seen families stick it out and families who have just come to the conclusion whatever we have to do to make this work, we're gonna make it work either separately or together, but we're gonna make it work. So we see there are rewards, there are, are challenges all the way across. Lisa, you may wanna to add to that one. Uh, just to tag on to that, I think one of the particular challenges for us working with the autism community is it's a big old community. And so because it's a spectrum disorder, You've got families um, with kids who are, we call, you, we call them high functioning sometimes, but highly vocal, Asperger's, that sort of in the good doctor sort of end of things, where you've got um, individuals on the spectrum, um, probably attending here, who are embracing that, that term and embracing that identity and seeing neurodiversity as something that brings a great deal to the community. But within that same fam group of families uh, who are living with autism, you've got people whose children as teenagers are unable to, to use the bathroom independently, have no way to communicate any words, spend all of their time uh, alone unless we are engaging them. So it's a broad community uh, with some similar needs, but also with some uh, disparate points of view and so trying to bring all of that together in a very short um, description of what we need with the, our donors and the, the people with whom we're advocating is, is challenging. It's, it's just, it's too big to make it uh, the nice little elevator speech that most people want. So as I move uh, throughout the African American community, uh, particularly here in, in this area, I find just way too much deep-rooted multi-generational poverty. Uh, and, and connected with that is oftentimes uh, single motherhood. And I think that the two of them almost walk, hand, walk in hand in hand. And I, I think the frustrating part of that to me is that the, the people that run agencies and organizations and services to, to potentially assist them uh, know very little about the causes and what is created uh, this multi-generational deep-rooted poverty and so uh, it's, it's often frustrating and, and particularly because it's very very difficult to have these conversations about what really is going on in the African-American community without having conversations about racism and that's a very sticky subject for us all of us want to you know for the last 15 years for sure um, sociologists have tried to convince us that we're living in post-racial America and so to have a conversation contrary to that a lot of people you know, aren't comfortable with that and they push back on it. And I'm just not sure if there are enough people in our society who are willing to accept that there are a historical cause that have brought us here. It's not, you know, this didn't just happen out of nowhere, uh, but there's a, a root cause and those root causes, of course, are in uh, the experience of race, slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, uh, that, that has brought us to this place. And, and um, some of those things are difficult 
to, to challenge and, and to tackle, uh, particularly when you, you don't always have the kind of resources and the kind of support that you need to do it. But I think that's what I find most in my work uh, working in the African American community. I think one of the challenges that we find in republician.org is, is the uh, challenge of loneliness. You know, that uh, you sort of sometimes feel like you've stepped outside the tribe, and that is a very dangerous place to be because human beings need the protection of the tribe. And so, of course, we're trying to prove that there is a tribe that you can belong to if you're a conservative concerned about climate change. But there are times when you feel like you are the lone wolf. Um, and so, um, but the thing that encourages me is I've seen this, I've seen it happen over and over, and I'm sure you may have seen it at a PTA meeting or a church meeting, or uh, I saw it in Congress a number of times where somebody speaking uh, some truth at the right time can turn the whole meeting uh, in the right direction. Uh, back to that diplomacy thing I guess I was talking about. Um, so, uh, for example, um, <clears throat> I uh, was called in by Judge Billy Wilkins, who at the time was the Chief Judge of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and I'm a lawyer, and I thought I'd just be meeting with him. No, 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 he had all of the other judges from upstate to South Carolina sitting there. And I was a local congressman, but I can tell you as a lawyer, I was intimidated to be sitting in front of all these federal judges, right? And so he called me there to tell me, stop doing mandatory minimums. Mandatory minimums are uh, provisions in criminal bills that say you're going away for this many years for this crime. And it's basically the idea of the legislature, the, the legislative body, in this case the Congress, says crack really bad, worse than powder, we're sending you away. Um, and so um, what he explained to me is since he was the father of the sentencing commission is that that was doing great violence to the whole scheme of sentencing reform, where they'd come up with, okay, this one's a little bit, you know, to hit somebody over the head is a little bit worse than stealing from their car, is a little bit worse than whatever, um, taking their bike or something, right? I mean, so um, he said, stop doing that. And so I went back to the Judiciary Committee and there was another mandatory minimum in the bill that was before us. And so I said, I, I told the story about meeting with Judge Wilkins, I said, I'm done with mandatory minimums. Howard Copel, a former member of Congress from North Carolina, sitting next to me, said, yeah, me too, I'm done with them. Then two other, amazingly, two other Republicans said the same thing, I'm done with them. It changed for a while on the Judiciary Committee. We weren't putting the mandatory minimums in the bills that were messing up the sentencing guidelines. And so it, what it takes sometimes is being willing to stand alone and to say something. You know, you've, I hope you've seen the picture of the be this guy. It's uh, all the folks who are doing the Heil Hitler salute. There's one guy. I don't know if it's an actual picture or whether it's uh, Photoshop. But anyway, he's sitting there stone-faced while everybody else is giving the Hitler a salute. And so it has red circle around it says, be this guy. And so um, that guy was, an out, was standing out outside the tribe, but in the end, he was right. So you want to yeah, yeah, have the courage to, to stand alone sometimes. I think uh, Bob's uh, comments are a perfect uh, transition to the last question that I want uh, our panelists to uh, answer. Uh, and as you prepare to go up to the microphone for your questions, and that is, after all that you've experienced in your work, has your civic faith been challenged? Has your civic faith been increased? Has it been weakened? I mean, how, how do you feel now regarding this community and communities of which you are part? How are you doing with your civic faith? Honestly. <laughs> that depends. <laughs> I don't know any other way to say it. Um, it because there are different <coughs> kinds of community. Um, in, in, our, in our autism community, my civic faith is challenged every day, but I think it's also strengthened because I see families willing to work together. I see kind, caring people who do have the wherewithal to make differences step up and say, let me help. 
So I think from that standpoint, it's my, my faith has been enriched in humanity and in, and, and the, the new the generation of young folks who are, are who are working for us, that community. I'm impressed every day with their sense of responsibility and their sense of caring, their their love for what they do. Legislatively, it is in, in governmentally, I think I have been challenged to frustration because you say the same things over and over trying to get someone to hear. And they're not all as good as Lisa was when Colby was trying to communicate circles have corners and corners have circles. They're not listening to what we're trying to tell them. They look at the short term, not the long term, like climate change and the impact there. So it, I think it depends on the community and I think it depends on the population that you're dealing with. But I think regardless of your faith in it, you have to work in it. And you have to move toward resolution and compromise and truly just working collaboratively or else you're not going to make that difference that you really want to make. I think the other thing that is um, extraordinarily frustrating is when you see things that have been implemented for the right reason, there's a good purpose behind them, but then the, the actual putting it into practice is nonsensical. So for example, we got the funding through that waiver so the kids were getting 40 hours of therapy each week funded, but then part of that package was, but you can't do it during the hours where uh, school is in session. So that cuts out 8 to 3.30 basically. You can't get 40 hours of therapy in for a child before the hour of 8 o'clock and after the child, after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You can't get, you just can't do it. Not with five and six year olds. So we're faced with something that we know what the purpose was. The purpose was we want to be sure that, that kids are getting school services if they need them. But it, it was a counter purposes to what we needed to do. So we keep hitting those. And uh, that's, that's a frustrating situation when you can't, you just can't get past the uh, barriers. I think, the, uh, as Susan said, the, the positives that have come have been when those people have stood, stood up, uh, when they've stood up by themselves and said, yeah, we, we get it. You know, one person at a time. We've seen people stand up and argue the point for us uh, when they were definitely uh, in the minority. Uh, we've seen people reach out to us who weren't touched by autism but wanted to help. Um, we've seen families who were unable to sort of see beyond their immediate crisis who then have blossomed to say, I want to be part of, I want to be part of a movement larger than myself. So um, that is always surprising and always gratifying to see. I think for me, I, I've come to uh, be diminished in my faith in, in our government's ability to uh, impact and improve the lives of, of a lot of African Americans, but I, I've become more encouraged by the growth in our society at large and the people. I, I think that people uh, in our society have gone through a tremendous change and transformation in how they view uh, the idea of race and racism, and, and, and we've come a long way. Uh, I'm not quite sure that, that our government is the entity that can fix the problems that we have currently. I think it's going to take more of, of a, uh, an idea of, of self-agency uh, in our communities to, to fix some of these things. Uh, and, and one of the things I've always looked at is if you look between uh, 1954 and 1964 when uh, essentially the uh, institutionalized racism and segregation was dismantled in our country. Uh, during that same period of time, you saw the greatest diminishing of the black family at the same time. Uh, which is kind of an odd thing, but uh, so it's just always made me to question, you know, can our government really fix some of the problems that, that we see uh, in our community? I think that there has to be uh, a community-based effort, in it. and I'll say in Greenwood County, uh, I've been very, very pleased uh, with what I've seen occur here in probably the last five years. I think there's been a, a tremendous amount of uh, desire on the behalf of people to, to reconcile some of the things of the past, to look at some of the problems, um, 
and, and I think that I, I, I'm encouraged by that. I think that if we can continue to create coalitions of people here who want to address issues relative to African Americans and, and black poverty and single families, uh, and, and incarceration, as he said earlier, certainly the uh, mandatory minimums have, have been uh, a bane to the existence of, of African American males in particular. Uh, it's caused uh, a tremendous problem in our community uh, with what we call mass incarceration. Uh, and, and so I think that if we, you know, can sit on a table and talk about these things, I certainly think that we could change them. Well, I don't know about you all, but if I get discouraged, and I do, <coughs> when I watch the national political scene, having an opportunity to be and to hear the stories of these good people restores my confidence and faith. Can we thank our panelists for their time and their presentation? All right, we have time for some questions. We have two microphones. Please uh, introduce yourself to the panelists and ask your question. Good evening. Thank you guys for coming. Um, my name is Mitchell Felton, and I am a junior sociology major. Uh, I know this is the, the day after the election, but because of your passions, do you find yourself voting only on that issue, or do you also vote on other aspects that might um, contradict what you are so passionate about? I think, personally, I vote on a lot of issues that I'm passionate about, but absolutely, just being honest, someone's <laughs> thoughts about autism do make a difference as they would if it was about racism or any other type of challenge or discrimination because I want people in office who care about people. Um, so I, I think when I'm looking at my particular issue, I'm looking for compassionate, caring legislators. I want people who can look at problems and honestly want to fix them and not talk around them or make fun of them, whatever it is they're choosing to do. So it, it does make a difference. But I think it makes a difference because in, when you're in the work of social services or you're in the nonprofit world, I think it changes your perspective on what you're doing. And I'd say certainly the, the position on climate change matters to me, but more what matters to me is sort of ind indicated by whether the person has some courage to step outside the party line a little bit. Because uh, if they're slammed up on the right-hand wall, which is where I find a lot of my fellow Republicans, so that they don't have any daylight between them and the wall, so they don't have any primary risk. Um, same thing happens on the left, by the way. Left-hand wall, people are slammed up on that because they don't want any primary risk. Those people are pretty much useless to the, prog to the progress of our society because the solution is not on the right-hand wall and it's not on the left-hand wall. It's probably somewhere in Solutionville. Now you can come off the wall with your sincerely held beliefs, but you gotta figure out a way to work with the people on the other wall and figure out something that works. And so uh, climate is an indicator of whether you're willing to come off that wall and have the courage to maybe get shot in the back. Um, you know, but that's, uh, I think, so I'm looking for that kind of courage. It's a high value for me. So this is one of, I think, my great frustrations as a person who sort of views politics through the eyes of what's best for the black community. Uh, because oftentimes the political landscape is very disingenuous towards us as to what's really in our best interest. Uh, we live in a time now where we as a community have bought into this idea that somehow voting Democratic uh, is, is somehow voting for the, the better, higher good of race, getting rid of race and racism. Uh, and I think that that's probably not very true if you really you know, drill it down to the, to the core of it. Um, and so sometimes, you know, when they come to us in election seasons and they start throwing things out to us that are, you know, black issues to vote for, uh, most of the time um, they're just red herrings. There's not really any substance there at all. And, and so I, I guess, you know, that when, I, when you talk about voting on race, it's a very difficult thing to do because you often don't really know what you're voting for. Uh, so I do find myself voting, you know, for other issues uh, because, again, voting for race is, is a very, very difficult thing because uh, certainly the Democrats have, have done a good job at, at uh, uh, 
controlling the language of that discourse to make us all feel as people of color that somehow this is you know the best place to label our, our, our to, to, to cast our vote uh, but I don't think there's really much truth to that and I think at some point I would like to see the, the, the African American community really come around to look at that uh, in a lot of ways we get sold a bad bill of goods by, by Democrats to believe that somehow a vote for them somehow a vote for us but uh, so I, I think I do vote to, I try to look at it through that way but it's a very challenging thing to do so I would basically agree with Susan, and autism is not usually a platform. Um, we were in a rare position this, this year in that James Smith has been a hero in the autism world in many ways with stepping up and, and speaking um, on behalf of, of some of the issues that are important to that community. But typically that's not going to be out there as a, as a platform piece, so it's looking for those folks who um, I think are service oriented and I, I agree with you Bob, willing to, to come off both ends so that we can have something that's actually going to move us forward. Thank you Mitchell. Other questions? Yes, Greenwood. It is, has brought up an interesting interplay because you are saying that, yes, the private nonprofit is essential to progress, but it is also dependent upon government subsidies of some sort, support, in order for that progress to continue. So I'd like to hear you talk about the fact that we need both of these entities, the, the not-for-profit, the community organization, and the larger entity which engulfs all of us that we call government. You really can't have one without the other. You're absolutely correct. I mean, we depend upon government for funding the government depends upon nonprofits to help individuals. But there's also another part that we depend on, and that's the private sector. We need all of that. I mean, it is all teamwork, it is all collaboration to make this process work and make it work effectively. Uh, nonprofits are often looked at in, in certain conditions as being wonderful and often looked at as being leading the community. But the fact of the matter is, a nonprofit, most of us have true missions, good missions to help, and without some level of government support, it is often very difficult. Medicaid is a huge part of our budget now, and without it, it would be a struggle. Yeah, I, I would agree with her in terms of the May site. Um, we have benefited by both the private sector and government funding, uh, and, and by just private individuals donating, I, I don't think that we would be where we are now uh, without that cooperation of people that have come together to make our site, uh, to, to, to bring our site to where it is, and to continue ongoing funding of it. Certainly, we, we have needed all of those sectors of our community to come together, and it's been uh, very helpful for us in our mission. The nonprofit side of what we're doing is to bring an education about uh, policy options that are available to us. And that policy option that we're most inclined toward as conservatives at republician.org actually involves just accountability and no subsidies from government. But it does, as you suggest, require something from government, which is bringing accountability for emissions. Two ways to go about solving or bringing on technology, at least two ways. One is to subsidize renewables. The other is to make all the fuels accountable for their emissions and eliminate all those other subsidies. So actually, you mentioned the word subsidy. We, we would prefer the latter. In other words, no subsidies for any fuels, um, but accountability for all the fuels. And the result would be the government would no longer put its thumbs on the scales and say, good boy, good girl, you've got solar. Good boy, good girl, you've got wind. Uh, it'd be rather, oh no, everybody's got accountability now. Now you decide how you empower your life. And, um, and the power companies decide in that free market. We think that that's a more efficient way to get to the outcome, which is a lot of innovation and energy. So, but you're right, we depend on government. We're educated, we're nonprofit educating toward a policy 
that policy will only happen if government steps in <coughs> to implement the policy. Our last question. Hi, my name is Joel Seymour. I'm a freshman here at Lander, and I'm currently studying mass communications. Uh, and I was wondering, as all of you are individuals who have very strong convictions uh, in your fields, I was wondering if you had any suggestions or words of caution or words of encouragement for people like me who are who do have those strong social convictions and and have those uh, those convictions for specific communities that we see around us but are only starting careers or are just beginning to pursue that career through college that may not be directly connected to that conviction. Words of wisdom, she's counsel. Our, she's our communications person. <laughs> well, I, I guess um, first, I congratulate you that you have uh, passions and things of, of which you will care about. Um, and I think part of the, the process we have had to maneuver is learning how to communicate about our causes in ways that bring people over to uh, the willingness to hear rather than to turn it into a defensive situation. So um, that, is a, that is a process that we have learned a lot about over the past 22 years and have become I hope, better at it um, so that we are trying to come at it with the um, ability to tell a story that has some commonality and to find those ways to um, to bring us together, you know, uh, things that, that um, we share so that then we can say, and here's the differentiation and here's how we want to, um, to, to explain that with you. We're always trying to bring people sort of into the fold. Um, I think if you do find those alongside what your career is and are able to add those, uh, your passions and your um, community engagement alongside whatever you're doing to actually make your living, uh, the more that you can bring those two things together, the, the better uh, quality of life you're going to have. Because as, as we say, we, we've got to make a living, but we, we also want to change lives while we're doing it. We want to make a difference. So, um, good luck with that. I think your selection of mass <coughs> communication is, is a critical choice. We, we just went through a whole process of the strat-op and, and surveying our, our our employees to find out what's important to them. We do that with our parents all the time. And not having adequate, appropriate communication is always number one on what people give us as feedback. They want better communication. And in the nonprofit world, and even in the private sector, communication is, is just absolutely critical. And as Lisa said, congratulations for finding in yourself that need to be part of something bigger. Uh, to make a difference in in this world. It's going to take more of you. <laughs> yeah. and I'll just add that uh, I think that's what, those are two bits of good advice. The other, maybe, is that uh, you can operate at the macro level or at the micro level. You can operate at the macro level that I've been talking about here tonight, which is policy and U.S. government policy, worldwide policy. Um, and that's rewarding, uh, but it's also tremendously rewarding to work at the micro level. So Reverend Thomas mentioned a person who couldn't read. To transform that person's life would really be amazing. So it, it, it's not like the macro is more valuable than the micro or the other way around. Both, you can be fulfilled at either level and anywhere in between the macro or the micro. Um, but I think it's good advice to find that passion and figure out if you can marry it to your way of making a living, that's really terrific. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes you have to be a tent maker, you know, and you have to sort of work a job in order to support your passion. Um, and, but yeah, it's, it's, it's great if you can fi find a way to make a living at it, but if you can't, uh, tent making is a substitute. Thank you. We have reached the conclusion of this panel in our time together. When you walked in, you were given not only a really beautifully designed program, you were also given an evaluation. And Lander students, 
if you want Fal's credit for being here tonight, we need you to fill this evaluation out. And as you hand it to the PA, they will scan your card and take your evaluation. If you're not a Lander student, we also need your evaluation too. Please just take a minute to fill it out and hand it to the PAs at the doors. Can we please thank our panel?